Hi, I'm Pete Stevens. Uh, my day job, I run Mythic Beast Limited, but also I am on the Lynx board as an non-executive director. How do I make this go? Oh, clicky thing. So, one of these things is the Lynx board and the other one is a cheese board. Matching the two together is an exercise for people watching the presentation. Hope you can all make, meet the, the basic level. So as you can see, one of these things has um, a lot of intelligent people who are going to make a valuable contribution. You decide which one. So what is the Lynx board? Well, we've got a chairman, Peter Cook. Um, there's six non-executive directors, of which I am one, who are elected. Uh, we have the CEO, Curtis. He's over there. He automatically gets a space on the board by virtue of being the CEO. And then we've got three executive directors who are Richard, Malcolm, and Malcolm Holt, and Jenny, um, who make up the, 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 the board as total. Um, and coming up in the not too distant future, we have an election where you can elect two non-executive directors because every year two of them stand down. Um, one of those, Seb, is definitely not standing for re-election because you are not allowed to be on the board for more than nine years in a row, and this is his ninth year, so there will be a space available for somebody new to come and join the board. So, what actually does an elected non-executive director do? So, there's quite a lot of confusion about this. So, and me included, even after I got elected. So, as a non-executive director, your job is to act to promote the success of the company and avoid conflicts of interest. That's what you have to do. This is not like Parliament. You are not representing a constituency of people. We don't get to vote. We don't have votes, and it's not a case of a majority vote wins. Um, the success of the company may conflict with what the people who voted for you want you to do. And your duty is to represent the company, not the people who voted for you. You are not an MP. Uh, this is something a lot of people, particularly the people voting for, are confused about. Um, so, yeah, it's all about promoting the company. The question is, what are the interests of the company and, and how, how do you do that? So the interests of the company come down to the founding documents, which are to promote interconnection and to act in the interests of the members, which is nicely vague and gives you some scope for deciding what you think the company should be doing. So, how does the board operate? As noted, we don't vote on things. We operate by consensus. When we, when we come up with a resolution or a decision that we're going to make, we all decide together, we all have collective responsibility, and we all support the statement. We often argue with each other. We definitely debate things. We quite often disagree with each other. But in the end, we come to a position that everyone will support. And that means we keep going until we get a position until everyone supports it. You, you can't lose a vote and then it goes ahead against your wishes. You all agree. Um, and so therefore, ultimately, you compromise if you want to eventually eat some food and get out of the room. Um, that's what happens. So you have to compromise. This is a job for someone who is willing to compromise and say, yeah, I might not be overly happy, but actually I can go with that. Or that's a brilliant idea. We should do it. You must compromise. So what do we actually do? We have board meetings roughly one, once a month. It works out at about 10 per year, um, which are full day meetings. And then as well as that, there's three subcommittees. There's the finance and risk subcommittee, which I sit on. There is the governance committee, which I slightly more reluctantly also sit on. And then there's a remuneration committee, which I don't sit on. So I'm not going to tell you much about that because I don't really know. So board meeting, typical board meeting starts over Zoom or is sometimes in person. A couple of years of those are in person. We've got a bunch of standard items we go through. Curtis gives us a CEO report. He tells us what people in Lynx have been doing. On top of that, there's a bunch of departmental reports. So everyone else has said what the departments are doing and what's happening in Lynx. And there's lots of detail you can go and dig out if you want to find more information. Um, there's some, uh, I don't know if they're statutory items, but things we always go through, health and safety, security because ultimately we are responsible for staff and the security if there's a data breach it is our fault as the board if someone is injured it is our fault it is very important to us that those things do not happen and we want to know if anything along those lines has been happening um, so as mentioned there's some departmental reports uh, we have to go through the minutes of the last board meeting and check that we believe that is a fair summary of what we actually said and when those minutes are approved they get published in the portal so you can go and read them and find out what we were talking about 
Um, the minutes, some of it is redacted because it's commercially confidential or under NDA, which is why bits of the minutes are missing when you look at them through the portal. Doesn't mean we didn't talk about something. It may just mean that we're contractually unable to tell everyone exactly what it was we talked about. Um, there's always a finance forecast, forecast in there, which basically deals with the really important question of, do we have enough money to pay our bills? As directors, we are responsible for making sure that the company does have enough money to pay its bills and very bad things happen to us if it doesn't. And then there's the subcommittee reports that come through as and when necessary. So those things happen every meeting. These are things that happen at some point throughout the year. So company performance, at least once a year, we go through how is Lynx as a company doing? How are we doing compared to the metrics we've talked about? Uh, Richard has got to keep the exchange up and running. He's got an availability target. We start asking very pointed questions if it's not being hit. Um, and that feeds into other things. So we come up with a measure of how we think the company is doing company strategy. Once a year, we go away for two days, usually in March, to uh, lock ourselves in a room and chat to each other until we agree on what Lynx should be doing. Probably not that much shouting, to be fair. We're actually quite nice about it. Um, and yeah, deciding what are the focuses, what should Lynx be doing in future. Uh, another thing that we do is we review and approve the accounts. So uh, our accounting team will produce the annual accounts of Lynx. Uh, we will ask lots of questions. Why is that number what it is? Is that really that type of expense? Why did we send, spend so much money on this? We also go through the auditors. So we are externally audited and we get a chance to talk to the auditors. And the auditors have done the same kind of questioning that we have and we can then ask the auditors questions like, do you think the accounting team are lying to you? Is the money really in the bank accounts or have they made it all up? That kind of question, um, which gives us a set of accounts that eventually come to a meeting and get shown to you. Um, there's some financial forecasting that goes into this, which is what are we going to spend next year? What are we going to spend it on? Why are we going to spend it on that? Can we not spend it on that? That's a question I ask quite a lot. Um, and which again feeds into the, is Lynx going to run out of money? Do we have adequate reserves? Can we pay our bills? Can we do the things we want to do? That then feeds into both pricing and products, which we go through every year. We do a pricing review where we have to work out what are we going to charge for services next year? How are we going to make sure that we have enough money to provide the services? Um, and then the other thing that comes up is changes to the memorandum of understanding, because quite often we discover that it doesn't quite fit what we want to do. And the other thing that turns up is changes to the memorandum of understanding. Uh, I realize technically that's a repeat, but it turns up so often I thought I'd mention it twice. So irregular things that happen. Um, so these are things that are not necessarily so predictable. So one of these, which you've obviously all heard about, is the opportunity to build an instant exchange in Kenya. We took this through several rounds of board meetings and discussions to try and work out, is this a good idea? Should we do it or not? Um, obviously, the thing that's not here because it's been redacted is the opportunities to build internet exchanges in places where it wasn't a good idea and we decided not to do it. Um, one that came up this year, sanctions and legal issues. That one took quite a lot of time up. Um, obviously, the government passes a bunch of laws about what you are and aren't allowed to do. My duty is to the company. The company can't break the law, um, even if you want us to. The members can vote for the company to break the law. We still can't because our duty is to protect the company, not to do what the members want. Um, and that one gets hairy very, very quickly because obviously the law is not clear and it does not say the London Internet Exchange must not do this. Actually, it's thousands of pages of documentation of you may not deal with these people, you can't accept money from these people. And uh, in case anyone noticed, we've got an Internet Exchange in the US, which gives us another jurisdiction. Uh, and that one gets messy really, really quickly. And actually working out what it is you think you may or may not be allowed to do is, is quite a lot, a lot of work. And then on top of that, there's, we have a regular kind of education slot for board members where another member of the board will often come and talk to you about things that are happening in their bit of the industry or things we think we should be aware of, which goes into the future of interconnection and what should, what we should, we should be doing in future. So subcommittees, this is where what I'm loosely going to call the work gets done. So the finance and risk, this is the one I know the most about. I've been sat on it for three years since I first joined the board. Um, and this starts pretty simply, where does the money come from and where does the money go? What we need to do is make sure we meet our responsibilities to be able to pay our bills. Um, and we have to 
make sure we've got the money where the money is, how it flows around, why are we spending it on things? Do we need that office? Is that necessary? Has Richard quoted a stupidly high price for switches? Should we tell him to go back and tell them to spend less? Can we do it on fewer switches? Um, and so there's a, a, which is not a technical question of, you know, I'm not trying to design a cheaper internet exchange. I'm just asking questions from the finance side of, you know, can we afford to do this? Does it make sense? Are we charging enough to cover the cost of it? Um, and a bunch of that turns into accounting. So you get exciting words like depreciation pop up, which is different to cash flow, which is different to profit and loss, which is different to your balance sheet. And then you get, uh, you know, capital reductions and deferred taxation and all kinds of really exciting things you probably really want to know about. Just a reminder, you can be on the board and not be on the finance committee. So you can just re read the reports of someone else who read that for you. That is an option. Uh, we work with the auditors, so we ask the accounting firm who audit our accounts all kinds of questions about how, how true things are. And that's kind of the finance side. On top of that, there's the risk side as well. So we've got a big risk register where we've written down all the bad things that we think might happen, uh, which was sort of dated not long ago to include a pandemic that makes it illegal for anyone to go to work. Um, and it also contains other things like what do we do if a data center stops functioning? What do we do if a data center burns to the ground? Uh, how likely are these things? What do we do? Do we have a plan? Have we mitigated them? And the idea here is to find things where uh, it is a risk to the business and we can mitigate it by doing something. And so, you know, having two exchanges or being in multiple sites and things like that. Uh, one of the mitigating ones we have now is what happens if there's a pandemic and everyone is not allowed to go to the office? The answer is we work from home and use Zoom. Got that one sorted. Um, and then the committee, can't make any decisions. All it does is it delivers a recommendation to the board about what the right thing to do is. So the second one I know a bit about is the governance committee. I've been on, the, on this one for a year. And basically we're looking at the management and governance process of links and try and bring it into line. So we've done a big review that goes with the corporate governance code. I can't remember exactly what it's called, but basically there's a list of things that as a well-run company, you should have to make sure you've got separation of powers and duties and things. And that comes up with things like you can't have the same non-executive directors for 20 years. After nine years, they leave the board and someone else comes and replaces them to make sure that you don't get a kind of in crowd that controls everything. Um, a lot of this involves changing the memorandum of understanding uh, and or arguably um, other things that happen in governance is discovering that the MOU doesn't actually work with the thing that we want to do. Uh, this is a trailer for what's coming up. There's a conversation later in this board meeting about the MOU and having peering services. Um, and you have to kind of resolve these by either changing the services or the MOU. Um, so, and that's what a lot of the governance committee does. Um, but the idea is to make sure that Lynx is a not-for-profit, it's running the inter interests of its members, and it's not possible to have it hijacked or used for a different purpose. It has to do, it, it has to live by the constraints of being the organization it is. Uh, we also have a remuneration committee, something to do with paying people. I think it, it looks at the, the higher level employees of Lynx and judges if their remuneration is at the right kind of level. It probably does some other reviews. I don't sit on the committee. I don't really know. Probably best ask someone who actually does. Um, so yeah, but there's the remuneration committee as well, and they're the three subcommittees that do the, the work. But again, they don't make any decisions. They just present a recommendation to the board and the board then decides. So direct powers as a non-executive director. To make this easy, I've written a comprehensive list of every power I have as a non-executive director of Lynx. I can't do anything. I have indirect powers only. What I can do is I can influence the board. And that's about it. So when I got to the end of my first two years on the board, I was kind of questioning if there was any point standing again, because I kind of was feeling a bit like I hadn't really done or achieved anything, because it's actually quite a slow process to actually do anything. Um, but since then, I've had another year, and I've made a bit more, a bit more process, a bit more progress. So um, some of the things that I've had a lot of influence in on, and this, this list would be different for every non-executive director, is... Uh, we have a treasury that manages our cash pile. We hold a lot of money in order to make sure that in the event we need it to deal with unexplained things or future investment, we can get hold of it. Uh, I decided that I thought uh, we should handle it better. In particular, I was concerned about the risk of 
having money locked up in a fixed term savings account for longer than was really a good idea. Um, this means that we will receive slightly less interest, but it guarantees availability of money if we really, really need it. Um, uh, that sounds really exciting, I know. I'm glad you're all listening. Um, but yes, uh, I hammered that through and then basically built a consensus to say we should change the way we do things and this is how we're going to do it. Um, another one that's come up is our Nairobi Internet Exchange. Um, we started from a, quite a vague sketch of we think there's an opportunity here. And then um, the Lynx team gathered together data and evidence about why it would be a really good idea to build an internet exchange in Nairobi. Um, and I sat there as, as a board member going like, is this a good idea? Is this just a waste of money? Like, is this just an excuse to go on holiday in Africa, which is quite fun? Why, why are we doing this? Is it a good idea? And uh, a lot of that was detailed digging through business plans, financial reports of like, what is this going to look like? How does this work out? And quantifying, I think our maximum risk is relatively small. Uh, I think the startup time to the point where it's break even is again, relatively small. And in the longer term, it looks like something that improves interconnection, focus of the articles, because it massively improves interconnection in Kenya where it's really, really needed. And secondly, it will pay for itself and effectively make a central contribution to running links as a whole, which brings the cost of all of our exchanges down because we're spreading our costs over a wider base. That's why I think we should do it. Um, and by the end of the meeting, uh, we'd gone from a mix of board members who were like, this is a dumb idea, what are we doing, to this is a low risk project that looks like it's got a really good upside, we should do it. So that was good. And another one fairly early on was uh, charging for private interconnects, which was not popular with 100% of Lynx members. Um, and basically, uh, that was a sitting down from the finance side, and it's a case of we lose money providing this service. The sensible thing to do would be to stop, but our members really like it. So do we stop providing it? because it loses money and risks the future of the exchange, or do we carry on and accept we lose money? And the answer is no, we just charge for it. And now our private internet connect service generates a small amount of money towards links to central funds, which means it's sustainable, it can carry on, and we can do that forever, which is great. So, um, so those are things I've, I feel I've achieved. But again, I didn't make any of those decisions. All I did was attempt to build the case for the whole of the board to say, this is a good idea and this is what we should do. And eventually, uh, through either sheer persistence or, or a reasoned argument, take your choice, uh, we came to a resolution and we did something and achieved something. So that's roughly your short guide to what an NED does. So does anyone have any questions? Who's allowed to be a member of the board? Is that related to... Is it because you have a fiscal uh, uh, and, and governance organization under UK law, is being a board member subject to only being a UK citizen, or is it any member of Lynx, regardless of their individual nationality? Uh, that's a question that's slightly above my pay grade, but you definitely don't have to be a uh, UK national. Curtis is going to stand in for me. You have to be nominated by a Lynx member. That's the only requirement. Thank you. Could you, would you say that um, you um, have perhaps um, had to row back on your primary job related responsibilities to be an effective Lynx board member? Um, so I reduced my working hours at Mythic Beasts by 10%. So I do nine days in every 10 now um, in order to free up time. Lynx does not take 10% of my time. It's less than that. Um, the rest I spend playing with my small children, which is quite a nice result. Um, so that's that's how I did it. I believe Alex Bloor did something similar. Um, I suspect if you work full time and did it entirely out of holidays and you get a minimum holiday allowance, you would find it pretty tough. But with a little bit of help, a little bit of support from your employer, it shouldn't be too difficult. Yeah, we do have another question um, that's come in on Slido. Um, bit provocative, see what you think the answer is. The board don't seem terribly interested in this meeting. Just three of the 11 are here in person. Can you explain why? 
Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, that was that was my comment, to be honest. Um, so uh, part of that is uh, it's we've clashed with Mobile World Congress, where for reasons of other jobs that people have when they're not on the board, that uh, at least three or four members of our non-execs are compelled to be at. Um, uh, so that's, I think that's lost our chair, Mike and Neil. Yeah. Um, and at the moment, uh, Lee is currently out in San Francisco. So he's remote attending because that's a long commute. Um, uh, but other than that, I can't speak on behalf of the other non-execs directly because I don't have access to their calendars or their minds. Shame, it'd be much easier to persuade them to the right way of thinking if I did. <laughs> okay. All right. Any last questions for Pete? Any other questions, approach me over coffee. I'm reasonably approachable. Okay, thank you very much.